So, ladies and gents, um, I'd like to open um, with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today and to pay my respects to elders past and present. I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander folk uh, who are uh, joining us today. Welcome to the ACT and region chapter of the Australian Citizen Science presentation, The Great Southern Bioblitz. Shortly, I'll pass to Libby to host uh, this evening, but first some housekeeping. Please stay muted throughout the presentation and for bandwidth considerations, you may consider turning off your video. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat function and we will ask them at the end of the presentation. Uh, set, the sessions today will be recorded and I will make it available in the next couple of days after the presentation. And now over to Libby. All yours, Libby, you're muted. Thank you very much, John. Um, the reason I'm hosting this tonight is because um, I'm actually going to be involved with the Great Southern Bioblitz. Um, I'm a bit of a Bioblitz aficionado, having been involved in uh, several Bioblitzes down here. And I'm actually on the far south coast of New South Wales. Um, but I didn't know about the Great Southern Bioblitz until this year, and uh, this year is its second year. So I'm delighted that we're going to be able to be involved with it. And what we thought we would do tonight is to bring together a few people who, who know what it's about um, to talk to us about um, the whole idea of the Great Southern Bioblitz. And the first person I'd like to introduce you, you to, if you don't already know her, is, is our very own Michelle Neal uh, from Redland City in Queensland. And um, in 2011, Michelle's young son presented her with a spider, a redback spider. And she convinced her son not to pick up spiders, but to take pictures of them instead. And Michelle soon found she had over 7,000 photographs of all sorts of creatures and not an idea of what any of them were called. So she became a citizen scientist and we're all delighted about that. But in 2014, Michelle was invited by Earthwatch to at attend the uh, Australian Citizen Science Association's first workshop in Brisbane. And she became the co-chair of the communications working group and worked with Jesse Oliver. Uh, to develop access social media, and she's done it brilliantly. Since then, Michelle, with her orange-coloured iPad clutched firmly in one hand, has been an active social media moderator, poster, and tweeter for AXA. Um, and she's worked in analytical chemistry for over a decade, but she now finds herself in an interesting place, a scientist as well as a citizen scientist with a passion for science communication. So having said all that and um, set the scene, um, take it away, Michelle. Thank you very much, Libby. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, fine. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. Mic check never hurts, right? Just going to tell you a little story now. As Libby's just sort of told mine, I'm going to tell you a bit of the story of the Great Southern Bioblitz. So last year in 2020, as we were all going through the beginning of that horrible pandemic thing, we, about eight of us here in Australia, had volunteered to run City Nature Challenge. Oh. All right, started at the wrong end. So there was about eight of us here in Australia. We ran City Nature Challenge. I'm up here in Redlands. We had Thomas and, and one other person down in Sydney. We had Greater Adelaide with uh, Stephen and co down there. Uh, Rod and uh, in Geelong. And later on, we had other people as well join too. So that was the whole City Nature Challenge. So City Nature Challenge is a global urban event during spring in the Northern Hemisphere. So basically it takes place pretty much around Anzac Day, which is not ideal for Australian conditions. People are away. 
it, it's usually done in cities rather than urban areas as well to see what sort of biodiversity is in cities. We have cities, but we also have a, a lot of urban areas. So we Australian organisers thought at the end of City Nature Challenge that we would really wanted to explore areas of unexplored biodiversity, particularly in our spring rather than our autumn. So we thought we would do our own bio blitz six months or so later after the City Nature Challenge, maybe invite, see if any of the other Southern Hemisphere people wanted to join in as well, just to have a spring one. We thought we'd get maybe 10 to 30 areas, mostly in Australia. We didn't actually count on getting anywhere from overseas. We thought we'd do it in September. We just had to pick a date and September is school spring holidays. So it seemed like in Australia, so it seemed like a good idea to us at the time. We were hoping for maybe 10,000 observations. If we got 10,000, we were going to be really happy with that. And we thought it would be a bit of fun. This is what actually happened. So we let it be known on the City Nature Channel, um, Slack channels and so forth, that we were, going to, we were thinking of doing one for South America. We had Larissa and a few others with us as well, who were originally from South America, asked their friends if they wanted to be involved. We started talking to some of the other citizen science people over in Africa and seeing if they wanted to be involved as well. We just said, you know, the more the merrier. So for the first year, we actually got 91,359 observations in a total of 157 LGAs or local government areas in 12 countries across three continents. Now you've got to remember, we started this in probably May. We started organising it. By June, we had a logo. We had a website coming. We had a Facebook page. We had an email account. And we kind of sort of had a date. And that's how we started. But it ended up being an interesting contribution here in Australia. The uh, iNaturalist node here in Australia from, that's run by the Atlas of Living Australia or INAT Australia, uh, actually exceeded 100,000 uploads in that month for the, for the first time ever. So as you can see by this little graph here, we've got this one here, the, the first one you see, the first peak you see in August, in April, sorry, that was City Nature Challenge. And then you look back six months later and there's the larger peak again for Great Southern Bioblitz. So who are we? <laughs> we have Thomas in New South Wales. We have Peter in Victoria, myself in Queensland, Stephen, Seamus and Larissa in South Australia. Unfortunately, I don't have Rod's picture on here either, but he's in uh, Geelong. And now we've got our friends overseas as well. Annabella in Argentina, Bianca in Brazil, who you'll meet pretty much tonight, Jessica also from Brazil and Jamie from Colombia. I didn't actually put Tony or anyone on there from Africa. They're coming soon for this slide. We actually found some endangered species, the Brazilian bare-faced tamarind, as well as some um, community favorite observations as well that we featured on our, on our platforms, on our Twitter and our Facebook and our, our Instagram. And we had some unrecorded, previously unrecorded species as well, which was really exciting. What I loved about last year was people got really involved with it. I think people had been stuck inside for too long and they decided that it was time to go outside. Even if it was just your own backyard. I know here in Redlands, we decided that we went into lockdown literally a couple of days before it started. And... I was speaking to some of the people that were, were going to be doing it and they turned to me and said, what do we do? And I said, well, it's just become a backyard bio blitz. So we'll just call it a backyard bio blitz. Do the Great Southern Bio Blitz in your own backyard. And I think that was the best thing about seeing a Great Southern Bio Blitz is you could do it in your own backyard. You didn't have to go for a walk or to have to do anything. You could just do it from your window if you had to. So when we keep in touch with everyone, we are known as Grande Bioblitz du Hemisphere Serio Sol. I'm sure I must mush that up. And Grand Bioblitz Guidia del Sio. Again, I'm sure I've mussed that up. And I'm sorry for those who speak Portuguese and Spanish, <laughs> but I don't. We're currently 
on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Slack, and Google. And we've Facebook. Sorry, and we've we've just got ourselves a gather space as well, and a website down below. So we do send out regular emails, etc. Anyone can join in, even if you're not in a particular area in 2021, anyone can join. So we hope you'll join us. Over to you, Libby. Thank you very much. That's uh, great. That's a very good um, resume of, of what the GSB is. Um, and now we're going to take you around the world a bit um, to see what, what's been happening elsewhere. And first of all, we've got uh, Rupert, um, Rupert Koopman, who's from South Africa. He's a botanist who's currently the conservation manager at the Botanical Society of South Africa. And he's tasked with strategically implementing plant conservation work in priority regions across South Africa. Up until the end of 2019, he spent 12 years working primarily with threatened species and habitats of the Finbos in the Western Cape. Uh, Rupert's interest includes seeing as many of South Africa's 3,000 odd threatened species as possible, supporting citizen science, making plant conservation more relevant and accessible to a broader audience, participating in multidisciplinary projects, appreciating indigenous plants and working with people from all over who love and appreciate the superb and diverse South African flora. There we are, that, that's Rupert. Now I'm going to try and launch his video. So if you'll give me a moment and then I'll try and share the screen. See if I can do that. Okay. Um, full size. Yes. Start it. Hello, I am Rupert Kopan from the Botanical Society of South Africa. I work here as the conservation manager, and um, I'm very happy to be talking to this brand new audience about um, how we get involved in the Great Southern Biobirds. So the Botanical Society is an, a membership-based NGO, uh, which has started in 1913 uh, in Cape Town. And we then, uh, as the gardens expanded, um, have branches across the country and uh, in some places where there aren't botanical gardens we also have a presence. Hello I am Rupert Kopan from the Botanical Society of South Africa. Sorry. Um, which is the, the kind of place where a lot of our uh, City Nature Challenge and GSB uh, observations take place. So quite a history of citizen science in, in South Africa from the Botsock perspective is um, in the late 70s and early 80s, a uh, group of, of members, Botanical Society members, um, under the loose leadership of Prof uh, Jackson, um, had a plan to start training um, walk leaders to appreciate the Fainbost in, in Cape Town area and beyond. And that program involved um, uh, lots of walks, uh, people from, from the Kirstenbosch branch of the Botanical Society, from uh, botanists through to just um, really interested amateurs. And uh, there's basically a golden thread running through all of this. Um, then we had the start of the Protea Actus project in 1991, which was a, a citizen science uh, involving program to map all the Proteaceae in Southern Africa. Um, please go and look that up. Um, and out of that, actually, because one of the, um, the project managers, uh, Ishmael Ibrahim, uh, then was involved with the starting of through the Custodians of Rain Endangered Wildlife, which is a project at the South African National Biodiversity Institute. And um, really uh, one of our most successful citizen science plant monitoring um, organizations. And this is one of the annual meetings in 2013, 
where it shows a, a lot of um, collection of uh, information on South Africa's threatened plants. And um, these records have been used for conservation planning, red listing, and so forth. And that, these then form the backbone of the iNaturalist community in South Africa, because people always ask me, um, you know, how does South Africa get to be this good <laughs> at, at um, uh, observations on INET? And uh, we've done a whole webinar about the, the kind of history thereof. So please check out uh, the link at the bottom on the Botanical Society website. But in this case, the, the golden thread is Tony Rupello. So some of you who would know him from iNaturalist. He's basically um, the godfather of INET in South Africa. Um, and before that, when we were involved in, on um, iSpot. And Tony uh, is a um, expert on proteas and conservation planning, proteaceae, actually, the whole family. Uh, and it's got a knack for mobilizing people. So this is a young Tony um, at uh, Pro Protea Atlas, um, I think sometime in the early 2000s, with an undescribed species at the time of Lycodendron. And this is him on one of the city nature challenges. So from a bot sock perspective, um, because we've got really close ties with through the custodians of rare and endangered wildflowers uh, in, in that um, we support them. Um, and a lot of our members are active crew participants. Uh, then we, we've been um, having the synergy basically between um, our branches in the country and um, and and I naturally because this is our, our kind of primary plant uh, biodiversity recording um, platform, and so uh, you can see in City Nature Challenge in 2021 these were our participating branches. So um, Victoria up in the north, um, uh, KwaZulu Natal Coastal, which is around the city of, of Durban or the Etiquini municipality, um, Alcoa. Uh, Garden Roots, and Cape Town. And then every year we, we try and, for each, each iteration, we try and build and expand the footprint. So you can see these are now the new uh, pots of branches that have come online. Uh, we've got Limpopo in the north, Lofelt, Kezid in uh, KwaZulu-Natal inland, Frankenfeld, which is in the city of uh, Johannesburg, and um, Southern Overberg for uh, and Kochelberg branches. So, so this area basically overlaps to um, municipal districts. And uh, as you know, uh, Cape Town is prolific. And um, so, so this, this is just the, the bar graph from City Nature Challenge of, of uh, 2021. And the participants, Cape Town, Garden Route, Etiquini, Chwani, Nelson Mandela Bay. And we're so excited to have this list much longer. So I was asked to also just um, talk a little bit about some of the Australian plants that uh, we've been recording as part of our City Nature Challenge So and, and GSP. Just a couple of quick stats about our flora. Um, so about a quarter of our flora is threatened. Um, and um, in terms of major threats, you can see that the, uh, the third highest threat by nose is invasive alien species. Um, and then if we look at this fantastic uh, report that was produced, um, the status of biological invasions and their management in Africa, which quantifies uh, some of the work that's been done in alien invasive removal, you can see that four of the top five are Australian occasions. And if you're interested in, in a much kind of broader um, and in-depth hour-long discussion about uh, the state of invasives and, and some of the things we're doing, which also involves citizen science, uh, I encourage you to check out this webinar, um, judging, uh, going from score attacking to employed uh, teams. Uh, there's a whole range of, of um, alternatives and, and, and practices to deal with the issue. So I just wanted to show you a couple of, of um, our threatened habitats where we've got um, Australian uh, invasives, um, and yeah, you know, there's uh, some beautiful Overberg sandstone fembos with the Lycodendron in the foreground of the Proteaceae family, 
and there's a bit of a wall of Hakia. Um, same situation uh, in the Babylon Stuaren area. You can see there's a thick wall here that's of Hakia and some European pines, and that whole mountain slope behind it is, is Hakia. So these are um, both high biodiversity as well as mountain catchment areas. Um, so the, the, the presence of uh, these thick invasives both threaten species as well as um, change the fire regime um, and uh, use more water than, uh, than the species that are found there normally. Here are in some Renosterfeld, which is a, a critically endangered um, subunit within the famous biome. Um, and here's members of crew looking at threatened species. It's a critically endangered cone bush in the, in the foreground here. And um, in celebration of Wattle Day, here is Acacia selegna looking pretty in some um, critically endangered or endangered Atlantic sand fynbos. This is a lowland wetland at uh, Riverlands Nature Reserve, which is quite similar to some of the, the habitats around Perth. Um, so also in uh, with Iron Actualist, we we able to both track the um, the existing invasives, um, the ones that have programs around them, and uh, have these sports hacking campaigns, but also now uh, being able to use it to track um, emerging invasives. So this um, Leptospermum continentale is the prickly tea tree is a uh, basically, we think it's a, a garden escapee, and it's established in two nodes um, in the Overberg. And but now we've been able to track it. Um, there's a researcher at Sandy, Tomelo Morape, who gave me the slide, um, who's working on it, and it's been brought to the attention of our local hack groups um, at the Kuhlberg branch of the, of the Botanical Society. So it forms a, a INET gives us a great tool to be able to track um, these invasives. So in conclusion, um, I just wanted to wish everyone well for the great Southern BioBlitz um, and celebrate this tool and, and the way that we can all get together and contribute towards the conservation and um, nature appreciation in a, most, in a very tangible way. So please, um, we'll be sharing our, uh, some of our experiences and, and infield um, parties <laughs> during the during the GSP on these on the Botanical Society uh, social media platforms and um, we hope that everyone has a great time uh, just documenting and enjoying your flora and fauna wherever you are. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much Rupert that's uh, fantastic wonderful to hear. Um, and if anybody has any questions uh, about that, Rupert is actually with us from South Africa today, so this evening. So please go ahead and, and ask him questions if you have them. Hi. <laughs> oh, there you are, Rupert. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very good presentation. Very interesting. Oh, thank you. Rupert, you, um, know, you talked about the, the hacking. Does that involve actually the citizen science also going and, and getting rid of the weeds, just not um, viewing them? Sure. So um, the, the sports hacking I was talking about is, is a kind of new thing. Um, if you check out uh, the webinar we had, uh, what's his name, Donovan Kotzer, who's a um, wetland ecologist, and, and he's basically put out a plan of going to his local mountain catchment area uh, where, where the invasives are not too thick and, and it's his form of exercise. So then he tags them, they, they've got a project on iNaturalist. Um, then our other branches are even more serious, basically. Um, the Kuchelberg branch of the Botanical Society have been hacking for almost 60 years in the Betty's Bay area because uh, they've got a problem with invasives in that beautiful vegetation down there. And then we've we've got um, state-sponsored uh, projects which go out and and um, basically target um, underemployed people to go out and also clear large areas. So there's several tiers of of work um, as well as uh, using biocontrol too. So it's we we try and have a kind of integrated approach to to invasives because they're such a big issue. 
Rupert. It's uh, Peter Brenton here from the Atlas of Living Australia. Um, and uh, thank you for that. That was excellent. Really, really great. Um, I'm just wondering uh, about the, the workflow um, in terms or the data flow in terms of submission of records through uh, the INAT platform um, in relation to invasives and how they get picked up and used by the agencies that manage the, uh, the invasive species. So before iNaturalist, there's also quite a lot of invasive mapping that happens from the various government agencies. So that's SANB at the national level, the Department of, of Environmental Affairs, um, the provincial agencies, so I'm in the Western Cape, so that would be Cape Nature. They do quite a lot of invasive mapping at scale. Um, and then at, so I think at this moment in time, um, INET is, is mostly used for emerging um, invasives. Uh, and, and, but also, I, the, I know that, the, for example, um, Professor Dave Richardson at the uh, Center for Invasive Biology at Stellenbosch University is a regular user so, uh, of, of iNaturalist. And, and he's obviously um, tagging and, and, and getting that information to his students. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite an integrated approach. Um, for example, in the Eastern Cape, uh, cactus are a big issue in the more arid areas. So that would be the kind of uh, Central American and North American cacti. Uh, and um, there's a research group which are also using iNaturalist to, to tag them. So basically everyone is kind of aware of, of the tool and they, they use it accordingly, whether it is by formally setting up projects or just to you know, tag whichever um, organisms they're interested in. Thanks very much, Rupert. Um, I hope you don't mind, we'll move on now, if that's no okay. Worries. But, um, at the end of the meeting, then I'm sure um, people will be very happy to talk again, if that's okay. Um, so I'll move on to the next uh, presenter who's from Brazil. Um, if I can just... I need to share the screen again, if I can do that. Okay. Now, the only thing that I know about uh, Bianca, when we asked for a bio, she said that she's, this is Bianca Darski from Tefe in Amazonas, Brazil. And she said she's a biologist, passionate about nature, enthusiastic about citizen science and scientific dissemination. So that's all I have, I'm afraid. So here we go. Hi, I am Bianca Darski. I am Brazilian and I live in Tefe, which is the state of Amazonas in Brazil. Together with Gustavo Ribeiro and Larissa Souza, I am part of GSP Leadership Committee in Brazil. Larissa was the first person who told me about BioBlitz and iNaturalist. And it wasn't the intention, but I took advantage of the fact that I miss and talk to my friends who live in other states in Brazil. And I started to spread the idea of the GSP. And so I naturally become one of GSP's national organizers. Last year, we went through many difficulties uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and also because of environmental disasters around the world, especially in Brazil with fires in the Amazon and Pantanal. And unfortunately, it's not over. And that is why it was important to create an event that, that brought us close to the nature. Many people of different ages participate participate of the GSP, and we were surprised by the engagement of so many people in different places in Brazil and other countries. In Brazil, people from 21 areas participated in the first edition of GSP. Now, in the second edition, there are 24 areas registered. We hope that GSP becomes opportunity for more and more people to enjoy days of connection with nature around us. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic is not over. Although there are many people vaccinated, therefore there is, we, this year we will continue to maintain all the care recommended by the World Health Organization so that GSB becomes 
another great celebration of biodiversity in the Southern Hemisphere. Join us at GCD. Bye. So there you have it. That's Bianca, isn't that lovely? And if you have any questions for Bianca, I'm sure if you put them in the chat that we'll send them on to her. So, um, uh, no. Libby, Larissa's offered to answer any questions on um, Oh, has she? Right. Oh, sorry. In that is. case, uh, Larissa can talk about um, Brazil or South America generally. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Bianca is a great friend of mine. So last year when we had, yeah, the first ideas about like inviting people from South America, she was the first one I thought about. I knew she would be very enthusiastic because like she loves nature. She uh, worked for a couple of years in environmental education uh, yeah, activities. Uh, I am based in South Australia. I, I just saw the question on the chat. I am based in South Australia. I am Brazilian. Sorry, I am Brazilian, but I've been doing my PhD with citizen science and mosquitoes <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, at the University of South Australia. And yeah, actually, I work with Steve, uh, Steve and Fricker with the Multi Monitors program. And yeah, we have a lot of citizen science initiatives in South Australia. And yeah, so last year when we were and organizing the GSP for the first time, I invited Bianca and she has so many connections all over Brazil and in other countries in South America. Uh, she's a biologist, she has a PhD in, in ecology. And yeah, so if now she's uh, actually based in the Amazon in Brazil and she works with a citizen science um, based program to collect information about fish uh, on the Amazon river between like yeah, Brazil, Peru, and Colombia. And yeah, so like we started our network from like people in Brazil we started growing because like she has so many connections and from other countries as well. And yeah, so like we had this massive participation from the countries in South America. We had five countries. Stephen will talk a little bit more about the countries in South America. But it was very exciting to see like how people were so enthusiastic because citizen science is very new in South America. So like when we organized some workshops this year, people there were some people who have never heard about citizen science like at all or have, have never heard about iNaturalist. And so some people were so enthusiastic like, well, this is an awesome app or this is an also awesome social media, you know, like to use to discover nature. So it, it was very nice to see all the engagement last year for the meetings, the first meetings that we had in Spanish and Portuguese at the same time, we had like over 35 people participating all at the same time, everybody sharing their experiences with environmental education and how they, why they want to get involved with the GSD because they were something different and innovative and an opportunity to promote their local projects as well. So yeah, we had this massive engagement from there. So oh, that's excellent. Uh, thank you for that. And um, I'm doing a presentation in the Citizen Science Conference next week. And Mariana Varese, who's um, helping to run the big Amazon Basin project, is doing a presentation on that during that uh, session. So that's, uh, that's great. Uh, there are a lot more people, a lot more places joining this year than last year. Yes, we had... Oh, I can't remember the number is now, but this is going to talk about it. Last year we had 21 places, local areas in Brazil. Uh, this year we had we have 30 just in Brazil. Like we had 25 by the time we recorded this presentation, but we had five more from last week to this one. <laughs> so we had like 30 places in Brazil. We we have like over 100 places just in Argentina. And yeah, so this year last year we had five countries in South America. But this year we have eight countries, so we have some new countries that joined for the first time. So that's very exciting as well. And it's always uh, interesting for everybody to see the different creatures and plants that you have in different countries. So I'm hoping that um, that will all be shared on social media so we can enjoy yeah. looking at all the different things. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. And. Um,
Now we'll move on to Stephen Fricker. And then Stephen, you're going to have to introduce yourself because I don't have anything from you. I don't have anything to talk about uh, your presentation. So could I ask that you uh, introduce yourself while I'm finding your presentation? Uh, I can share my own presentation if you want. Excellent, that's good. Right then. here. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't intending on doing a presentation, but um, I think uh, that, that's changed now, so obviously. Um, yeah, I'm Stephen Fricker. I'm from the University of South Australia. I, um, I have a background in uh, mosquito biology as a vector ecologist and also with uh, citizen science, um, basically with the Mozzie Monitor program and also engaging older Australians in citizen science, which I've been doing with Professor Craig Williams at the University of South Australia for uh, several years now. Uh, and I've been involved in the, um, uh, the GSB from, uh, from the initial setup of the, uh, of the event. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the GSB coming up this year. Now, is that right, Michelle? Yeah, it's great. Okay, so uh, basically I'm Stephen Fricker and, then, and today I'm talking in the capacity of uh, being a member of the organising committee for the GSB. And I'm gonna talk about the Great Southern Bioblitz in 2021. So what I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit about the timing of the GSB and uh, some of the thoughts behind that. Uh, a little bit about our various regions and some of our side projects. So with our timing, um, the Southern Hemisphere is a quite a complex uh, place. It's uh, half the world. It's, uh, it, it ranges from um, Tierra del Fuego all the way through to, to Kenya and um, from, the, uh, from the coast all the way up to the top of the Andes. So it's quite a complex area. And holding a bioblitz at a particular time of the year doesn't really suit everyone because some areas last year that when we did our bioblitz were still under snow in Southern Argentina and they wanted to participate, whereas other areas in Africa still hadn't received their rain. So again, it wasn't ideal for them. Holding the bioblitz too late in the year will be not particularly good for some areas of Australia where it gets very, very hot, and there are a whole bunch of issues around snakes and, and temperature. So not one, one size will not fit all. So we had a bit of a discussion about this and had some consultation with all the organisers from around the world, and we came up with some potential solutions that we thought we would um, try. And the first one was to rotate the date. So we decided that rather than have the bioblitz at one time of, uh, at the year, uh, during the year, that we would actually rotate the date around. Now, there, there are some issues around that of when you're doing a bioblitz from year, year on year, you would miss certain things around phenology, when things uh, flower, you won't get collect data on, uh, on specific animals at, um, year after year. However, uh, that's not really the main goal of the, um, the Great Southern Bioblitz. What we are intending to do is to increase engagement that will then feed through to other citizen science programs, which I think was pretty much the, uh, the gist of um, what Rupert was talking about just before, where they use and leverage um, activities such as the Great Southern Bioblitz and the City Nature Challenge to increase participation in citizen science more, bro more broadly. So the idea of moving it around, it, Essentially, it won't suit all the people all the time, but it should suit most of the people at some point in the future. So this year, we've moved it from September to October, and it will be occurring tomorrow morning for, from, from midnight in, um, in Australia and a little bit later on in Africa and South America. So it makes sense in the Southern Hemisphere to break uh, the Southern Hemisphere up into three areas uh, based on language groups, but also uh, time zones. So we have broken up the Southern Hemisphere into a region of Oceania, uh, Southern Africa and South America. And I'll talk about each of these regions in turn and just give it a bit of a background as to what happened last year and what we expect this year. Now in Oceania last year, we had 34 areas involved, including Fiji, uh, with a thousand observers. And we recorded about 28,000 observations across the whole region, which was much more than what, well, it was about what we expected for the entire the entire project out, um, was, was recorded just in Oceania. We kind of expected around 30 areas and probably be 20 or 30,000 observations. And we thought that would be pretty good. 
But this year we've grown to 95 areas in Oceania uh, and 48 of those are in Victoria alone. And Oceania has um, it's, it's got a diverse range of, um, of areas involved. We've got many LGAs or local government areas involved. Uh, a lot of local councils, particularly in Victoria, have taken this on and decided to um, create their own projects. Uh, we have many rural areas, which is what, what the, the aim of, um, of our project was uh, to, to do, was to separate ourselves from something like the City Nature Challenge and involve more rural areas and country areas if we could. This year, Fiji joins again, and this year would be great because um, the Fijian organisers are a bit more organised. They came in a bit late last year, but now they're um, they're in full uh, full swing and they're out of lockdown, so they're looking pretty strong. And most excitingly for us, our uh, brothers and sisters from over in New Zealand have also decided to join us, and the whole area, the whole of New Zealand, has got projects covering the the entire country, which is. Really good. Last year, they did actually want to join. We had one area in, in New Zealand, but unfortunately, the timing was just, it just didn't suit the, uh, the organiser, which was most unfortunate. Now, Southern Africa. Um, last year, we had five countries involved and eight areas with about just under 400 observers. But the, um, those 400 observers, um, amongst them, made 23,000, and I think most of those were Tony. Um, but... Uh, I'm not really sure, but I predict think they were. Uh, but interestingly, in South Africa, the, one of the, the areas with most observations actually has a huge youth con um, contribution as well, which we're pretty excited about. I think about 20% of the observations during the City Nature Challenge in, um, in Cape Town are actually from, uh, from scouts and cubs. So this is a really good, to, uh, really good um, thing in, in Africa in particular. This year, we've got seven countries in Africa and 20 areas involved in the GSB so far. I haven't checked the stats of late, but they've, they've been pretty steady over the last couple of weeks. However, some of the more interesting things that we've had uh, out of Africa this year is that we've had two first-time countries, uh, Malawi, uh, and that's a very small project on the, on the shores of the lake, and um, Eswatini, the whole country. Um, so that's also pretty fantastic to have them both join us this year. We've had many new areas join us from Southern Africa, uh, from South Africa, increasing the engagement in that country, which is um, fantastic for us. Uh, and there's also some news coming about a, um, an extra node in, in, in South Africa. Uh, South America, now this is the big boy. Um, they do definitely win the... Um, the prize for enthusiasm in South America. Enthusiasm in South America. Last year we had five countries and 146 areas with 1,280 observers, and amongst them they made 40,000 observations. And a lot of those were from from young people. We had a young girl who observed a lot of pot plants, but also she observed some endangered parrots in her own yard. Uh, and um, this was great to see. So we had a lot of um, a lot of real engagement there. A lot of um, uh, um, webinars and um, videos and um, tours and things like this. They really got, in, got into it. This year in 2021, they've, we've grown by uh, three countries to include eight countries and 157 different areas, which has um, impressed us a lot because we've had three first-time countries, including Chile, Uruguay and Paraguay. And um, the map is... It's almost certainly filling up. This year, they've had a lot of in online engagement and much and many workshops and um, and activities throughout South America, including Brazil, uh, Ecuador, and um, and uh, Colombia. Uh, now, as part of the GSB, what we've decided to do is have a few focal ideas and ideas that people can get involved in such as um, Moth Night and Sea Slug Sunday. We've also had a few other little um, events, things like um, Five on Friday, where we encourage people to make five observations on a Friday, and uh, a one square metre where people can make observations within a one square metre in their backyard and challenge themselves to find as many different species within that one square metre. We also have a Shake a Tree and a Backyard Biodiversity Challenge. Again, ideas about trying to get people to get engaged in, in, in investigating their own biodiversity. So I'm going to talk about two of these. The first one is Moth Night, which is something we've tried a few times. And we've actually decided to make it a standalone project. We did this last year and we're doing it again this year. And a new initiative called Sea Slug Sunday. 
So Moth Knight is a standalone project in, within the GSB. Uh, the reason for this is it allows people in the Northern Hemisphere to join and people outside of areas that are designated as GSB areas to join. Uh, last year, we had 24 active participants across the Southern Hemisphere and in the Northern Hemisphere. And we made about 500 observations. So it's probably not as um, massive growth as the, uh, the GSB itself, but it's still, it's pretty good. The difference about this one is people actually have to physically join the project, whereas with the other ones, they can just be within the area and make observations. This is the second year it's, it's um, actually happening. And we've also got global participation. We've got people joining up in North America again, and we have um, at last count 54 um, participants joining. So hopefully we'll have uh, a lot more observations and we've actually organized a few events around Moth Night because we've, we're allowed to in, in South Australia. Uh, we, we've also had a new event occur over the last two, two weeks called the, um, the Great Sea Slug Sunday. And this is a similar project to, um, to the, the Moth Night. It's the first year it's going to be run and it's a collaborative project with the Sea Slug Census Program. Uh, we've also invited a global participation, and this is a bit of a tester this year. So hopefully we'll be into a bit more of a uh, an intense uh, event next year with a lot more um, organisation around it. But we're just testing the waters this year. So I just want to thank all of our organisers, and this is a selection of our organisers uh, on the right, and um, some of our main organisers there on um, uh, underneath the thank you. We've got so many different people around the world helping us out with this and getting involved. Uh, it's really great that, um, that they are also keen. And I just want to wish everyone luck on the, uh, on the weekend and I hope you find something new, something you haven't seen before, a different species. And if you're really lucky, a species that hasn't been recorded on iNaturalist, which I did last year, and that's my bragging rights. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much, Stephen. That's great. Uh, right. Uh, so any questions for Stephen, or perhaps at this time we probably need to uh, move on a bit. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Claudia to talk to us about what's going to be happening in, in the ACT over the weekend um, in the ACT challenge. And again, I can't really introduce Claudia because I don't have a bio. So Claudia, could you introduce yourself and do you want to run your slides or would you like me to do it for you? Yeah, thanks, Libby. I'll introduce myself and I've got my slides here, so I'll just pop them up on the screen now. Excellent. Well done. Okay, does that look good? That looks very good, yes. Okay, thanks, Libby. So I'm Claudia, um, living and working on in Canberra, Nunnable Country. And I work at the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. So I'm really a citizen science, not a scientist at the moment, but I do love ecology. I studied at the University of Queensland and I'm particularly passionate about entomology, love insects. Um, so I was first introduced to the Great Southern Bioblitz because I was already an iNaturalist user and I'd seen a post about the project created for Sydney. Um, and I, I first thought, like, what about Canberra? I'm a bit competitive, so I really wanted to see how Canberra would go against Sydney. And there wasn't a project for Canberra yet. So when I asked the organizers about this, they said, why don't you start one? You can be the organizer for Canberra. Uh, so that was my first introduction to creating a project on iNaturalist. And since then I've been inspired to do a few others, including one about rearing caterpillars through to identify them based on their adult moths. So it's been really exciting. <clears throat> I think there was a question a bit earlier about data sharing and the Great Southern Bioblitz. So one of the things I really love about iNaturalist is the fact that all the records you observe, once they reach research grade, feed into the Atlas of Living Australia, as well as other databases around the world, such as the GBIF, and they can be used by scientists in real research, which is fantastic. And I've used the Gangangs here as an example because there's a really interesting project on Gangangs and um, Southeast Australia at the moment, which would be great to check out. <coughs> so Canberra and the Great Southern Bioblitz. Last year being the first year the Bioblitz was run, um, we had about 680 observations in total over the four day long weekend, covering 280 species made by 30 observers who we call iNaturalists or iNaturalists. 
And nine out of the top 10 species were birds, which is not surprising because we have lots of passionate twitches in the ACT. I thought it was really interesting that yellow-faced honeyeater was the second most observed species. So I think there was someone pursuing a group of honeyeaters on that weekend. Um, the other great thing about the Great Southern Bioblitz is it encourages people to observe as much as possible in a concentrated time frame, which I think is fantastic because it encourages you to look at things that you might typically overlook, like really common species or something that you wouldn't normally pay attention to. So for me, I'll be trying to put some more plants in my observation list. Um, and I've just put up a graph here of observations in Canberra over the whole year of 2020 on our naturalist. And you can really see the impact that the Great Southern Bioblitz made on the number of observations. So Great Southern Bioblitz in Canberra for 2021. What can we expect and how do you get involved? So this year, as Stephen said, the Bioblitz will be in October rather than September, which I think is great for Canberra because it'll be a little bit warmer. Unfortunately, it looks a bit rainy this weekend. So I'm looking forward to lots of snail and frog observations. Um, I'd had a little bit of a look on a naturalist at October observations to see what you might find. And the ones I thought were particularly interesting was it's a great time to spot pinked ducks and royal spoonbills. So if you're heading to Jarabomba wetlands, that would be some things to look out for. There's more reptiles emerging as it heats up, maybe some blue tongue lizards or bearded dragons. Um, insects are becoming more active as it gets warmer and it's the peak season for bogong moths around this time. And there's a wider array of orchid species. So although some of the ones you might see on Black Mountain, the pink and purple orchids are finishing now, there's lots of donkey orchids and moth orchids to spot. Um, I thought we'd set some goals for ourselves for 2021. Perhaps we could try and reach a thousand observations this year, and maybe 500 species. So try and double our efforts on last year. But Given how much we exceeded expectations in the first year of the Great Southern Bioblitz, I'm sure we can smash those goals. Um, my personal favorite goal at the moment is um, to see a bit more diversity in the observations, maybe get some non-bird species in the top five. So if you're interested in getting involved in the Great Southern Bioblitz, there's three steps. Firstly, download the iNaturalist app or go to iNaturalistorg.org to sign up. Join the project, which is Great Southern Bioblitz 2021 Canberra, and start making observations. Any observation you make over the period will count towards the Great Southern Bioblitz project. Thank you. I'm not, thank, thank you for that clue. I'm not quite, quite sure what's happened to Libby. Sorry, uh, I, I was muted. on mute. Typical. Yes, uh, sorry about that, Claudia. Um, I was asking you John's question. He's uh, asking how far the ACT area extends so that other areas can join in. How far, where are you creating your patch? So the um, Canberra ACT project covers the boundaries of the ACT. So. It covers the Magic Park, but it doesn't extend into any of the New South Wales water towns. Right. So there's a gap between ACT and where we start, which is at the at the escarpment down to the sea, down to Marimbula and, and uh, Bermagui in that area. So yes, but I think um, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong. You can still participate in the Great Southern Bioblitz, even if your area is not represented by a project. It just won't. Um, go specifically towards an area. It'll be counted in the totals at the end. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I, I don't think we it won't be collected in the in the totals. We set up a, um, a, a others project last year, um, but you can definitely participate in the uh, the moth challenge. I leave on your backlight and take some observations at night of moths. Uh, and there, yeah, but we didn't actually create a. Uh, a additional project this year because we 
you can you can um, set up your own project though next year, and um, and I'll get your council to join a project in the adjacent areas. We do have a number of um, other projects in New South Wales and in um, and in other areas though. Thanks very much for that. Now, um, just to round off uh, before we ask Stephanie to talk about the conference, uh, Michelle, would you like to um, finish off for the Great Southern Bio Blitz and? Uh, send us on our way or enthused. Absolutely. I'm looking at the clock now and I can tell you that Fiji is two hours ahead of us here in Brisbane, in Redland City. Um, so at the moment over there, it is ooh, half past nine. So this will be kicking off very shortly. So if you haven't already got your iNaturalist app ready and your, your phone charged and your camera charged, I suggest you do it really quickly. Over to you, Libby. Right, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all the speakers. Um, uh, and Larissa, uh, please tell Bianca that we enjoyed her presentation very much, even though she wasn't here. Um, it was really good to hear from Rupert and really good to hear from the organizers. And Claudia, good luck in your area. And thank you all very much. We look forward to um, up when we've got a question from Janet. She says she's just on the other side of the Murrumbidgee in the New South Wales. So what about her data? Claudia? Anybody? I, I'm not sure if they actually have a project on that side there. Um, I don't think we have any any projects down there. Seems like there's a lot of people who want to get involved. So there's a good opportunity there to uh, find a, um, a citizen science leader in your area. There we are. And, and Michelle's put the uh, umbrella project up there so you can check. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, for that. And um, let's all think, keep our fingers crossed for the weather. And now if I can uh, ask Stephanie to have a, a chat to us about the conference. Brilliant. Just as we're sort of getting towards the end, I'll just do a quick pitch for the um, conference coming up, the um, SITSAI Oz 21 uh, virtual conference. So 27th to the 29th of October. It's not too late to uh, join up. We've got some fantastic um Keynote speakers, Kathy Foley, our Australia's chief scientist. Um, we've also got Kurt, Dr. Carl. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Corey Tutt as well from Deadly Science. He'll, go, he'll be talking to us and Costa as well. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to see how Costa's hair will we'll work on the um, with these virtual block gowns, but we'll, we'll see. But there's an amazing array. So go and have a look at the, um, um, the, the conference website, but there's an amazing array of... Um, uh, sessions there, both in terms of uh, um, sort of symposiums and, and long talks as, as well. You know, we've got a particular early career, uh, early mid-career uh, scientists, citizen science sort of group as well. International speakers, um, New Zealand, Africa, uh, Colombia, uh, Europe as well. We've got different things across different sectors from sort of the marine and, and water space in terms of, you know, marine debris, that type of stuff different ways that you can do citizen science. We talk, there's some talks around um, the technologies and data um, as well, and even some um, highlights from some of the citizen science um, projects that were funded um, by um, DISA. So yeah, I hope everybody can um, register and, and come to the conference and we'll, we'll see you, is it next week already, I think? So yeah, looking forward to every, seeing everybody there. Yes, yeah, so it's six days and counting. Six days and counting, that's right. <laughs> that's why my inbox is getting very full. That's right. Thank you very much indeed, Stephanie. And back to you, John. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers from tonight and Libby for hosting. Uh, and hopefully we all manage to get out there and you know, even if we get a little few spots of rain on us, it won't hurt us uh, and make those observations. And with that, I'll wish everyone a good night. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, let you know about the next, next series of presentations. Good night, folks. Thank you and good night.